Recording. Alrighty, so today we have our workshop for the Water Efficiency Technical Assistance Program. I appreciate that everyone is here uh, to participate and um, listen to our discussion and, and um, we'll answer questions throughout and we also have some time at the end to answer any additional questions that you guys have. Um, I'm going to be going through um, the WETA program and provide some uh, information about resources uh, for the application process and just show you um, what you might expect when you go into the new application platform and also show you resources on the web page as well. Okay, so uh, we did a little bit of welcome and introductions. Um, we're going to go through the application process and just kind of bounce in between. Um, so we'll be doing that kind of throughout the presentation. Um, before I get started into the presentation, I just want to show you guys what the web page looks like. Um, hopefully you can still see my screen. Um, you don't see the PowerPoint now. Hopefully you just see the web page. But this is the WETA web page. Um, as you can see, there's um, several resources on this page that are pretty useful. Um, there's this big button here that will take you to the application itself. Um, there's the Zoom registration for the workshop where we're gonna put that recording here or below. Uh, the RGA is also listed here. So if you want to um, see the details of the grant program, just go to the RGA and you can find a lot of really great information there. Um, and then we also have this uh, um, document that we created. And essentially what this does is it just kind of has a navigation of using Amplifund. Um, and so we're gonna kind of take a little bit of a dive into Amplifund today uh, during this presentation, but this is a really great resource if, if you're new to Amplifund and don't really know how to navigate through the, um, through the application questionnaire. Um, there are several sections of the questionnaire. So this is a really good resource for that sort of thing. And so we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the web page also has some resources about the past solicitation. So uh, feel free to, to come over here and, and check that out as well. Um, but for now, when you wanna when you wanna start your application, you're going to uh, go to this link here, the apply to WETA program. Um, and then that will take you to the opportunity information page where it's gonna give you some information about the program itself. Um, so all of that is here. There's several uh, apply buttons. The public link is actually gonna take you right back to this page. So you don't really need to click this link here, but there's an apply button here and there's also an apply button down here. Um, I already uh, submitted a test application and I just withdrew it a little earlier today. So we'll kind of go through what that uh, process looks like in just a little bit, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to our presentation for now to give you a little bit of context on the program itself. And then we'll just, we'll come back to this, okay? So if you guys have questions, just um, hang on to them until I get to, to um, if you have questions about the application process, just hold off until we get to this point, okay? All righty. Um, so the WETA program is still a relatively new program. It's in its uh, second year. Last year, we received a one-time funding allocation of $5 million to dedicate for water efficiency and nutrient management towards technical assistance. Um, this year, we're fortunate um, that we've been appropriated $15 million from the California Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, for the grant awards, the maximum award amount is $500,000, and it's for a three-year grant term. Um, and again, the program is designed to facilitate technical assistance um, to agriculture operations for on-farm water and energy use efficiency and nutrient management. Okay, um, this is a list of the eligible entities. Uh, so this should be pretty familiar if you um, have applied last year or um, are familiar with our technical assistance programs. Uh, you must be located in California with a physical California business address. Um, those eligible entities include RCDs, 
They include University of California and California State Universities, as well as California Community Colleges. Um, nonprofit organizations as well are included and federally and California recognized Native American Indian tribes. Uh, entities that are applying for water grants must have demonstrated expertise in on-farm irrigation, water and energy use efficiency standards, evaluation and implementation of efficient practices, and or on-farm nutrient management. And what we do like to see as well is that there is um, a partnership with a GSA or irrigation districts and or water um, quality coalitions. So those are highly encouraged as well. So we're gonna speak a little bit about the three program objectives. Uh, these are should be familiar if you've applied in the last um, solicitation. Um, these haven't changed too much. So the first objective is on-farm one-to-one technical assistance to evaluate irrigation system efficiency, um, AKA mobile uh, irrigation labs, and also to provide diagnostics, reporting and recommendations to growers. Um, and just as a reminder, applicants don't need to apply to all three of them. You can apply to one of them or two of them or all three if um, that's what you would like. Um, but yeah, it's not necessary to apply to all three. Um, in addition to the evaluation of irrigation systems, grant recipients can also assist farmers with irrigation water management technology. So an example of that would be um, assistance with soil moisture sensors, ET station information, um, calibration of those um, technologies, uh, the interpretation of data, and also training for the proper use of those technologies for irrigation scheduling and monitoring and also for nutrient management. The second program objective that the WETA program has is coordinating or providing pump efficiency testing. Um, so that can be purchased on behalf of growers and it can also be pour, bleh, performed on behalf of growers as well. So uh, uh, the pump efficiency test is, is a, is a requirement for the SWEEP program currently. So that's something that um, uh, folks generally uh, have a request to do. So um, that's a high uh, request item as well. So that's definitely something that we like to see um, um, that the recipients work on um, doing those pump efficiency tests for growers. Um, and then that third program objective is providing training regarding water nutrient management practices and technology. Uh, so the grant recipients for WETA can develop these uh, training curricula and programs related to irrigation water use efficiency and nutrient management. Uh, you can create these training programs via workshops or like a virtual meeting or uh, webinars. Uh, and the development of those training um, uh, training sessions could be uh, in, in English or it could be in non-English. And in fact, we highly encourage that, um, that it's provided in other languages other than English. Um, let's see. And then one other thing is that we highly recommend that grant recipients um, provide a certificate of completion to individuals who do complete uh, training for um, water use efficiency and nutrient management as well. Okay, before I move on, it looks like we have a couple questions. Um, it looks like one of our questions was, a couple of them have already been answered by Carolyn, but I'm seeing one here. Would the grant cover implementation of new remote irrigation applications that help manage and control water usage? Irrigation applications. Um, the question is about whether or not folks can purchase that type of equipment with this funding. And um, Suzanne, uh, correct me if I'm I'm wrong in interpreting your question that way. But but no, this this program is focused on technical assistance. Yes. Yeah, so um, probably a better fit for this sort of thing would be the state water efficiency and, and enhancement program, Suzanne. Um, so if you have questions about that one, we could perhaps chat a little bit about that um, at the end. Um, and then I'm seeing another question. Can these funds be used by RCDs that don't have water efficiency slash irrigation specialists on staff? Um, 
and expand their services. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, from my understanding, it, it can, but what we want to see is that um, we want to see like a plan that's justified and explained well in the application itself. So if you don't have irrigation specialists, we'd like to see like um, details on how uh, how that RCD or how the, the applicant, applicant organization is going to, um, you know, provide services for uh, California growers. Does that make sense? Essentially, we want to see details on, on how that, how you will be providing services to growers, even if you don't have irrigation specialists specifically on staff. So any bit of information that you can provide to us in the application um, is pretty useful for um, for the application itself. Caroline, do you do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't. I'll, I'll also type some answers um, while you're presenting. Thank you, Steph. Okay, awesome. These are really good questions, you guys. So thank you for asking them and continue to ask. Uh, we'll keep stopping to answer them as we go. And Carolyn's doing a great job as well um, with answering them um, in the chat. Okay, moving on, program restrictions and requirements. Um, awardees must not charge fees to provide assistance to farmers and ranchers. Um, also, if awarded, um, awardees must not require specific proprietary products, contractors, or services. Um, so we want to leave that pretty open to the growers uh, to determine for themselves. We don't have any um, like specific list of of products or services or vendors that we want folks to to you know be pushed to um, use. Um, the the awardees must not apply as a lead applicant for the WETA program on more than one application per funding cycle. Um, awardees also need to declare conflicts of interest, and they must also prioritize assistance to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers and farms and ranches of less than 500 acres. So we'll get to um, the prioritization um, and assistance to SDFRs and farms and ranches of less than 500 acres, but this has, um, you know, in the last solicitation cycle, this was also a, a prioritization as well. But we'll talk a little bit about the changes that we've made in the application process regarding um, the prioritization to SDFRs and, and small ranches. Okay, so this is our tentative timeline. The application period began last week. Uh, applications are due June 6 of this year. We will have a short uh, review period taking place between June and July, and we are hoping to announce awards in August of 2023 and hoping that that grant term will begin in fall of 2023, specifically in November. Okay, so here we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and I'm going to go back to the um, the application portal. Um, so uh, what you're going to want to do when you're applying is that you're going to um, um, it's it's best if you look at the RGA. You don't have to look at the RGA, but the RGA is there um, as a as a resource in case you have any specific questions. Um, and it also goes through the application materials so that the link below is, is going to take you to the um, the RGA, um, that's also linked in the WETA webpage that I showed earlier. Um, and the application platform is through Amplifun. So this is a new uh, application platform that um, is being used um, CDFA wide. Um, and you're going to complete the budget template within uh, Amplifund, and you're also going to be uploading your resumes. So this is a little bit of a different process from um, our other like incentives programs within OFI. Uh, in the past, we have had we have asked folks to log into our application platform and uh, fill in a work plan and, and submit that. Um, but the budget and the work plan are both included in Ample Fund, so you don't have to download that and then submit it. Uh, it's it's kind of built in already into the um, 
the platform itself. But what you will need to do is, is upload resumes to the application. So I'm going to show you a little bit of, of what that looks like. Um, before I do that, I'm going to just show you um, we have a little bit of information here in the budget template itself, and I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like in Amplifund. The link here is, is uh, just to the navigation and preview document that I showed a little bit earlier that was on the Weta website. So if you're finding that you're having some uh, difficulty kind of navigating through the um, the application itself, I would highly recommend going back to the web webpage and looking at that navigation and preview doc because it's going to be kind of just like a walkthrough document and and walk you through exactly like all of these uh, these segments of the application process. So we're over here in the opportunity details section. Um, this is like a navigation bar right here at the top. So when you're done with that, it's going to populate this little logo with a check mark. Right now it has check marks because I've already done this and I submitted this application, but I withdrew it. When it's not filled out in its entirety, it's just going to be like a blank white circle. Uh, so we're here in the opportunity details tab. Uh, it just has a little bit of information about the program itself, the funding information, et cetera. Um, we're going to save and continue. And we're going to move on to the next uh, tab here. So this is the project information tab. I'm not going to spend too much time showing you guys um, the whole everything of, of all these steps here, but I just want to show you uh, like how to navigate through this really quick. Um, something that is important is that when you're going through the application process here, what you're going to want to do is save uh, often, um, and you can do that with a save button. You're also going to mark this as in progress, um, and then you're going to want to save and continue. So if you don't mark as in progress, then it's not going to um, want to allow you to save and continue. Um, and, and it'll just kind of show up as this little circle um, when you're going on. And then when you do save and continue and mark as completed, uh, it will, it'll change into a check mark. So I'm going to move on to my application. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time going through the application itself. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a lengthy one. We have um, questions here, lots of questions. Um, note that we have uh, several, most of the questions are required and it has this little star right by it. So if you go through the, um, the application itself and you don't, um, and you miss a question that's required, What's going to happen is that when you try and save and continue, it's going to, it's not going to let you, but it will kind of flag it in red. So if I did, if I left something blank, then it's going to tell me like I left something blank and then this will pop up in red to show me that I didn't fill that out this section. Um, so our work plan is here. It's included in the application process. Um, so you don't have to download a, a work plan and then submit it. It's already built into the application. Um, I, I apologize that I'm going through this kind of quickly, but I don't want to spend too much time on the application itself. Um, the budget is going to be on the next page. We had to kind of build uh, a description of the budget here at the bottom of the application questions itself. Um, but you're going to fill out the budget on the next page. So we're going to mark this. I think that when you actually do the application itself, it says mark mark as complete. I don't think it actually says mark as in progress. It might say this just because I withdrew it. But we're going to save and continue, and we're going to move on to the, um, the budget here. So this is what the budget looks like. It's going to be blank. I threw in a bunch of Zs in there because uh, I was adding line items and just playing around with it. For me, I, for the total grant request for this project, I uh, did an example of $400,000. Um, so when you add a line item, you want to make sure that all of your line items are going to match up to the total grant request here and that this is going to be zero. It's not going to um, let you continue otherwise. So you have to make sure that those amounts kind of add up. So you'll see when, it, when you do this, um, Let's see if I can just delete this one really quick. Uh, yeah, so now it's telling me I have I ha my total grant request or the total revenue budget cost is still 
a total of four hundred thousand dollars, but I am missing requesting two hundred thousand dollars. So this amount needs to be zero. So when you're when you're working on the budget, you're going to add line items by pressing the plus tab, and then it's going to give you this little pop up. So you can fill this out. Um, I'm just going to put something random. Um, All right, and then uh, we would like to see some, uh, you know, a description here. So that's what this narrative box is. So just throw in some details about the line item, and then you're gonna hit create. Okay, so then now this goes back to zero. That's what we wanna see before you save and continue. Um, and the budget really is like the last step. So the application and budget are kind of like the meat of the application itself. And then you're going to continue on. Um, and I can't submit this because I've already submitted it and withdrawn it just to show you what, what all of that looks like. Okay, um, so we've kind of talked a little bit about the budget, how, how to, um, uh, you know, add a line item, but those the budget has several sections to it. So we'll go back to that because it's a, a little easier to read that. Um, we have a, a personnel category. Uh, travel category, equipment, supplies, consultants and contracts, indirect and other. Um, and in the RGA and also in this um, presentation, we have these budget category definitions here. So for example, personnel, um, in that section, you're going to want to, uh, oh, let's go back to, um, that's going to um, include the salaries, wages, any fringe benefits for the personnel working on this project, um, the contractors as well, that's the salary, wages, fringe benefits, any travel, equipment, supplies, other and indirect costs. Um, again, you're going to want to, um, you can look at the RGA to uh, provide these definitions as well if, if any of this is confusing. Um, the supplies are the items that have an acquisition cost of less than $5,000 per unit um, that are used exclusively for the objectives of the project. Um, and equipment are non-expendable, tangible, personal property items with a useful life of more than a year um, and an acquisition cost that equals or is higher than $5,000. Travel is pretty self-explanatory. That's going to include your mileage, um, lodging information, per diem, that kind of stuff. Um, the other category is going to uh, include anything like registration fees for attending, um, you know, pro any professional um, meeting, education or training, um, any meeting spaces or equipment rental subscriptions. Um, and yeah, the indirect cost is going to be uh, facilities and administrative costs that can't easily be tied directly to the activities of the grant. Um, so an example of like a common indirect cost might include admin or clerical services. Um, another example would be like rent or utilities or internet and phone services, um, that sort of thing. Okay, moving on. So here's uh, some examples of allowable costs. Um, again, you can find this information in the RGA, uh, pages 14 and 15. Uh, oh, no, actually, page it's going to be on page 8. Um, but some examples might include translation services, um, reporting and invoicing. Um, and you'll find uh, reporting and invoicing information specifically on pages 14 and 15 of the RGA, um, the participation of professional development courses, and any trainings that are relevant to the program objectives. Um, assisting or facilitating the pump test for a potential sweep applicant. Um, so we spoke a little bit er about the pump test earlier. Um, but what I do want to make clear um, in the allowable versus unallowable costs is that um, you are allowed to assist um, folks with the pump test, particularly also if they are a potential sweep applicant, considering that the pump test is a requirement for applying to 
um, the SWEEP program. But what we don't want to see is that um, we don't want to see folks assisting growers with the implementation process um, of their SWEEP uh, project, nor do we want to see uh, folks helping uh, potential applicants apply to SWEEP. So this is just for the pump test itself. Uh, we have technical assistance uh, for SWEEP, the SWEEP program um, already. So we want to make a you know, we want to distinguish between assisting folks with sweep and the implementation and the application process and just helping folks with the pump test. Okay. Um, another allowable cost um, would be vehicle leasing and other travel expenses. Um, so again, see page eight of the RGA for more information and more specific examples. Uh, we have here um, some examples of unallowable costs. Uh, so personnel or contractor hours that are not related to water efficiency and or nutrient management evaluation, um, audits, training, admin, or any non-related fields, um, the completion of tasks that are outside of approved work plan and budget items. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, assisting farmers or ranchers as they apply or implement um, their projects uh, for SWEEP, Healthy Soils Program, or AMP, and also research is considered unallowable as well. Uh, food, drinks, and entertainment. Um, a lot of folks are going to be probably hosting workshops or webinars or um, in-person uh, activities. So food, drinks, and entertainment are not considered allowable costs. Um, and then the purchase of a vehicle is not allowable. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stop here and see if we have any other questions really quick. Um, I don't see that we have any currently open questions. Um, yeah. Does anyone I... have any hands up? Yeah. No hands up, but folks, remember you can, you can use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask your question live. Looks like you're good stuff. Okay, yeah, I don't see any hands either. Alrighty, um, so I think Carolyn checked this morning the inbox and it seemed like we did have a couple questions that were already submitted to the um, email address that is listed here on the um, PowerPoint. But we do uh, take FAQ questions that we will post online. Um, the reason why we do it this way is that we want to maintain the integrity of the competitive grant process. So we don't generally advise or provide details to answers to questions um, to individuals, um, particularly regarding the application itself. So during that solicitation process, we we won't we won't be answering um, individual questions. But what we will do is we will allow folks to submit their questions um, to the email address on screen. It's cdfa.ofi underscore CSA. I know it's hard to see the underscores there, but like where there's a gap, there's an underscore. <laughs> so it's ofi underscore CSA underscore TA at cdfa.ca.gov. Um, and we will be posting responses to those questions um, on the web page. Um, using the schedule that's listed uh, below. So for questions that are received by April 21st, we will be um, supplying a response by April 27th on the webpage. And then we will do another round of FAQs for questions that are received by May 26th. Those will be posted by June 1st. Um, just a little bit of information about the review process. For the program, we do have a two phase review process, the first phase being an administrative review. Um, and during that admin review, uh, we are essentially checking to make sure that all of the um, all of the questions have been answered, um, that applications are complete, that they don't have any unreadable or corrupt or unusable attachments. I think that this will be less of an issue now that we're using Amplifund and we're relying a little bit less on uh, specific 
attachments. Um, but for those um, items that you want to attach, like CVs or resumes, you you definitely want to make sure that those um, items are readable and they're not corrupt or you know a different um, format than what we're expecting to see. So generally, I think you're probably going to be safe with a PDF document, that sort of thing. Um, we will be uh, at this point. We would be disqualifying. Um, applications that are considered um, incomplete. Um, again, this will probably be easier using um, Amplifund because you're not really able to submit your application if it's unanswered or if it's a, a question that, that requires a response. Um, but definitely you're going to want to spend some time on the application process, double checking that you've answered everything to completion. Um, any applications that include activities that are outside that grant duration, um, we may consider um, disqualifying as well. Applications that have unallowable costs or activities um, necessary to complete the project objectives. Um, and then projects that are requesting more than the maximum award amount. Again, this is gonna be difficult to do because um, Amplifund is is pretty strict, so that budget template itself is is difficult to uh, it's difficult to get away with um, requesting an amount that's more than the grant award amount. I've already tried, um, so but just definitely spend some time um, ensuring that you are submitting the correct um, amount and you're not going over the the award amount. I don't think it's possible to actually do that, but just double check, You're, you may want to double check before you um, submit your budget information. Um, applications that don't comply with the eligibility that we talked about before, or applications that don't meet the program requirements and restrictions will also be disqualified. So that is the first phase of the application process. Um, the technical review process is a little um, more of a lengthy process where projects are going to actually be scored. So in the admin uh, review process, the, we're just checking to make sure that everything is there and everything is um, you know, making sense and it, it's everything has been answered, everything, all of the attachments are there and readable, that sort of thing. But the technical review is where we actually start scoring on the 100 point scale. So we'll talk about that next. So the RGA has a lot of really great information about the scoring criteria of these, um, of the application itself. Um, it, it will go through the information on what exactly we're looking for uh, when you're filling out the statement of qualifications. Um, that's worth 30 points, 30 points. The prioritization of assistance to SDFRs is worth 10 points. Um, and I did also mention that we would talk a little bit about the prioritization of SDFRs. And the reason why I wanted to um, spend a minute or two talking about this is that in the last solicitation, we really um, focused on uh, wanting to see a prioritization of assistance to SDFRs. We still want to see that. We still want to see the, that um, applicants are committing to using 25% of the funds to support SDFRs. However, after some talks and like some roundtable discussions that we had with um, previous applicants and folks that didn't necessarily get funded or folks that did get funded but had some feedback for us, we decided that we were going to do a um, partial point system for the prioritization of assistance to SCFRs. If you are not able to commit 25% of your funds to supporting SDFRs, what we would like to see is that you justify why you cannot and, and why. So in that section, the prioritization of assistance to SDFRs, we wanna see a narrative, an explanation as to why you can't and um, how you are going to be able to reach SDFRs. What is your method of, of, of um, reaching out to those SDFRs, even if you can't make it to the, 25, the full 25% of the funds that will be used to support them? So I think that what we're gonna do is just, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, I think the maximum that you can earn for um, partial credit is like five points. Uh, so if you don't get the 10 points fully, you can you can still receive five points partial credit for justifying like why you can't reach that um, amount and what you're going to do to try and, and reach that 25% if you can't. 
Yeah, I, I want to just follow up with what Steph said. We do have more in the um, request for grant applications this time around describing how applicants can earn partial points um, by estimating what percentage of funding they do anticipate being able to spend on SDFRs and, um, you know, and justifying that based upon the demographics of their service area and their outreach plan. So that is one of the um, bigger changes that we made to the, the request for grant applications in this funding cycle. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, the work plan uh, section, that is uh, a big chunk of the application itself. Um, that's when you're going to be uh, providing narrative and information and, and a lot of detail about um, the objectives of the of the program and, and how the applicant is going to be meeting those objectives. Um, so that is um, included in the main uh, section of the application on Amplifund. And then we spoke about the budget, which is worth 20 points. Um, all in all, everything is worth 100 points. I would highly, highly recommend that folks um, go to the RGA and look at the um, scoring criteria section, because that's going to provide you with some um, important notes and and uh, questions that we are looking uh, for answers um, when you're doing the application. Um, a little bit about the awards and regrets notices. Um, the awarded applicants, the awardees are going to be receiving specific instructions regarding the award process. Um, and that will also include some information about invoicing and reporting requirements. Uh, applicants that are not selected for funding will receive feedback uh, regarding their application within 60 days after receiving um, notification. Um, CDFA will also be posting basic information regarding the applications received at least 10 days before awarding the grant funds. Um, and after projects are selected, um, and all funds are encumbered, CDFA will be posting an updated list of those awarded projects to the web page. Um, applications will be treated in accordance um, with the Public Records Act requirements and certain information uh, subject to those requirements may be publicly disclosed. Um, a little bit about the awards process. Um, uh, after the awarding of the projects, um, awardees are going to be working on their on executing a grant packet. Um, during that time, CDFA is going to be communicating with the awardees to get um, the information that CDFA will be needing to execute the grant. Um, the timeline for this is pretty variable. It really kind of depends on how communicative uh, the awardees are in providing information to CDFA staff, um, but the execution itself of the grant could take up to 120 days. Um, and the anticipated grant term, um, as mentioned earlier in the timeline, um, is November of 2025. Um, yeah, is in November of 2025. Um, actually, no, wait, it's November, not November 2025. Um, awardees can't be reimbursed for any expenditures and activities that are completed outside the grant term. Um, so just make sure that when you, if you do get awarded that you're not submitting invoices that are uh, taking place outside of that grant term because we cannot reimburse it. Um, I think we'll have to fix that um, gear um, in this PowerPoint before we post it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, there's some information that we can provide about the payment process here. Again, there's more information about the payment process and reporting and invoicing on the RGA. Um, we will also be posting um, the grant awards procedures uh, manual, also known as a gap manual, and that will be posted on the web page as well. So that will have some other information about some of these processes. Um, but definitely take a peek in the RGA is a really, really useful resource um, regarding a lot of these processes. Um, but briefly, um, CDFA is going to be providing customized quarterly invoice templates for the awardees. Um, we kind of played around with this process in the last solicitation, um, but I think we've landed on uh, 
sending a customized uh, invoice template for the awardees to fill out each quarter. Um, funds are going to be allocated on a reimbursement basis. Um, and we are hoping that folks are going to be submitting their invoices um, at a minimum quarterly. Um, the the uh, reimbursement, uh, we would like to have substantiating documents. So that could include things like time logs, travel logs, uh, receipts, uh, invoices. Um, so all of that should be uh, submitted with that invoice template. Um, and CDFA will be withholding 10% of the total grant award until a final report is submitted and approved um, to ensure that grant recipients are meeting all of the reported requirements. Um, okay, so we spoke a little bit about that um, quarterly uh, report template. Uh, that template is going to need to include um, information about the individuals that are assisted. So the total number of, of uh, folks assisted, uh, the information of the farmers assisted, and this doesn't need to be you know, personal information about the growers that you're assisting, but mostly we want to have a quantification of, of the number of folks that are being assisted by the awardees. Uh, number of individuals assisted who identify as SDFRs or farms that are 500 acres or less. Um, the costs associated with assisting uh, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. The number of irrigation assessments conducted. Um, number of irrigation water, water management assessments um, that are conducted as well. Um, also total number of pump efficiency tests if um, those are also conducted. Uh, if you're hosting workshops or trainings, what we wanna see is um, total attendance in person and online uh, for those workshops and trainings. Um, and then any links or files to digital training materials that you've created, um, or, um, and in particular, those files and training methods that have been translated into other languages as well. Um, awardees need to maintain detailed project records in office for three years after the project completion. Uh, CDFA may conduct a critical project review during the grant term, um, and if the awardee is not meeting and is unlikely to meet certain milestones, CDFA has the right to terminate the grant agreement um, pursuant to the terms and conditions of the grant agreement, and termination may result in uh, forfeit uh, by the grantee of any funds retained pursuant to 10% uh, of retention policy. Okay, so that was a lot of nitty gritty details about what was required. Um, I went through the Amplifund uh, website pretty quickly and also the website, the WETA website. Um, does anyone have any particular questions about um, what is required or um, the navigation or how Amplifund is functioning or just in general, any questions at all? And feel free to, uh, you know, raise a hand or uh, throw a question in the chat if you're not wanting to speak, speak up. It's quiet in the Q&A box. 